from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, MEI's editorial director. And today we're going to be talking about the rapid rise in tensions between the U.S. and Iran. To discuss the current situation and where things might go from here, I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Alex Vitanka and Jerry Firestein. Alex is a senior fellow here at MEI, and Jerry is MEI's senior vice president. Alex, Jerry, thank you both for joining me today, and welcome back to the program. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Alex, let's dive right in as there's a lot to discuss. Over the past few days, there's been a steady escalation in tensions between the U.S. and Iran playing out in the Gulf. What's driving this, and where do things stand now? You know, Alistair, as we came to the first anniversary of the decision by the Trump administration to kind of pull out from the 2015 nuclear agreement and the decision by the uh, Trump administration to introduce more sanctions, and on top of that, the Iranians being disappointed in what they felt was very slow European sort of assistance to them, uh, because let's not forget that the Iranians have been waiting all along the last year hoping that Europe somehow could do enough to provide for Iran's economic needs that would justify Iran staying in the nuclear deal, even though the Trump administration had taken the U.S. out of it. Now, when it came to the first anniversary, the Iranian felt the Iranian side felt that the Europeans weren't doing enough, that American pressure was just piling on, and they had to do something. And that something was their decision to partially withdraw from uh, parts of the nuclear agreement. And this, as we've seen over the last few days, escalated with mostly, and this is important to stress, mostly a war of words, brinkmanship on both sides. And from all I can tell, fundamentally, the, on the big picture, Tehran does not want war with the United States. They don't underestimate what that could potentially mean, which in worst case scenario from their perspective would be the end of the Islamic Republic as we know it. Uh, on the U.S. side, I would probably have to take people like Secretary Pompeo at their word when they say they're not interested in war either. I, I don't think the U.S. takes you know, the option of going to war with Iran likely either. So that leaves me to sort of think, at, at least for right now, we're seeing both sides flex in muscle mostly obviously in the region, in, in and around the Persian Gulf uh, area. And the only danger is that this escalation and war words, uh, by accident, uh, becomes a hot war. We're not there yet, but that's the danger. Jerry, I wanted to ask you about some of the specifics of this uh, muscle flexing in and around the region, starting with uh, the events on Sunday. Uh, four ships... Saudi, Emirati, and Norwegian vessels were, were damaged off the coast of Fujairah in what the UAE government calls an act of sabotage. How much do we know about what happened there at this point? Well, it's under investigation. Uh, I think that we've seen some photos of at least some of the ships, and they did apparently suffer some relatively minor damage, uh, nothing that either threatened the integrity of the ship, resulted in an oil spill, or, of course, caused any loss of life. So they were relatively minor uh, in scale. Uh, they're being investigated. And of course, uh, the Central Command has said that they are cooperating and coordinating with the UAE government on the uh, investigation. How significant is the location where this happened? Fujairah is a major regional port. It's a, a major center for, uh, for bunkering of oil, I know, as well. But it struck me that the significant thing is that it's actually outside the Strait of Hormuz, which is the flashpoint that everyone normally points to when they think about risks associated with the Gulf and, and oil in Iran. Well, let me uh, uh, first make the point that I agree entirely with Alex's uh, analysis and to also draw in the second event uh, over the last few days, which was the alleged Houthi drone attack on a Saudi oil pipeline. And you're absolutely right on both of these points. If we go back and look at Javed Zarif's visit to the United States at the end of April, he was in New York. He made a very well-publicized speech to the Asia Society in which he said, basically, that if um, there is uh, an effort on the part of the United States to uh, bleed Iran to death, 
then Iran had options. Iran would retaliate. And he went on to say Iran would retaliate against, first and foremost, the UAE and Saudi Arabia. So right after that, we've seen these two kind of mystery events occur. And the significance of them is exactly as you said, that both of them were outside the Strait of Hormuz. The pipeline that was attacked was, in fact, the pipeline that allows Saudi Arabia to bypass the strait and to export its oil directly from the Arabian Sea. The attack on the ships, again, outside the Strait of Hormuz. And it seems to me, although it's not established, and the United States has been very careful to not say that we are convinced that Iran was behind this, but if it was indeed uh, to be established that it was an Iranian attack, then I would say that the significance is that the Iranians were demonstrating to the United States as well as to Saudi Arabia and the UAE that they do have cap uh, capability and that they can strike uh, uh, Saudi and uh, Emirati assets outside the strait and interrupt the flow of oil and upset the global energy market. If you're sitting in Riyadh right now, how concerned are you about oil infrastructure security? Well, uh, you know, there have been concerns about Saudi Arabia's oil in, uh, industry and infrastructure for many, many years. We've been working with the Saudis to help improve their critical infrastructure protection. This has been a high priority for both of our countries. Remember, there was a failed terrorist attack on the huge upcake uh, oil facility over 10 years ago. And as a result of that, we really identified what these vulnerable facilities are and have worked at uh, improving their uh, security. But nevertheless, there have been attacks. There was a very well-known uh, cyber attack against the uh, against Aramco. There have been other kinds of attacks. And I would have to say that depending on the nature of the threat, uh, even though they are much stronger and robust today than they were 10 years ago, they're still vulnerable. Alex, on Wednesday, the U.S. State Department ordered all non-emergency U.S. government employees out of Iraq. And according to media reports, U.S. officials have claimed that there's intelligence that Iran has uh, greenlit attacks on U.S. forces of the region. What do you make of that? How credible does that seem to you? I would argue um, that if you monitor um, what the Iranians are saying right now in terms of their options, it's very clear to me that, you know, Having proxies in Iraq uh, fire off rockets uh, and targeting U.S. forces would be the kind of escalation that the Iranians are trying to exactly avoid. So I, I, I'm skeptical, although obviously I don't have access to classified material and what the U.S. government is able to detect in terms of what's going on in Iraq. And I would also say this. If you are Iran and you feel that perhaps the U.S. has certain military intentions by perhaps generating certain chatter, moving troops and forces around, uh, deliberately allowing that to be picked up by the U.S. to sort of let the other side know, Washington that is, that you know the Iranians are preparing uh, to retaliate, again, as a way of shaping the calculations of the U.S. and perhaps allies in the region. I'll probably include the Iraqi government as part of that camp. But fundamentally, I don't see the Iranians are going to embark on um, the kind of, because, you know, having proxies in Iraq hit U.S. forces would represent a major escalation and I don't think the Iranians want to go there yet. And uh, to Jerry's point, you know, what we've seen with the vessels in, uh, off the coast of Fujairah in the Gulf of Oman, if it turns out to be the Iranians, there's two things here. The damages are relatively small. Presumably, they, they could have sunk those vessels if they wanted to. Um, deliberately, it seems to be designed in such a way to make a point, but then take a step back, having made the point. And I would say, when I look at 
uh, the military posture of of the Iranian regime overall, uh, while they obviously believe their use and uh, the availability of the pro proxies they have in the region is certainly a positive from their pro point of view. When it comes to, if it comes to a confrontation militarily with the United States, they have always argued their strength is bring the United States into the homeland, if you will, what they call the quagmire, and then proceed to uh, to sort of attack the U.S. forces within Iranian soil. I think they feel much more comfortable on that front than being able to pursue a comprehensive region-wide military uh, lasting military campaign against the United States. They simply don't have the resources for that. Uh, the best what they can do is kind of a hit and run operations, which will not be a lasting uh, campaign. So if, if I could put it to you this way, in a, in a scenario where U.S. and Iran go to war with each other, I would envisage the Iranian regime probably would uh, feel it would be better placed to make the United States bleed if the United States actually enters the Iranian homeland. And obviously, we're far from that point right now. Absolutely. Jerry, taking a step back, what do rising U.S.-Iran tensions mean for the, the region more broadly? It seems like, uh, as, as Alex touched on, Baghdad is probably in the most precarious situation of anyone. But what's your kind of read on, on the region as a whole? Well, uh, uh, certainly it's going to uh, to raise tensions across the board. I, uh, if you're if you're looking at uh, uh, any kind of a uh, political uh, way forward in Yemen, it's going to make it uh, somewhat more complicated, particularly if the uh, Iranians are encouraging the Houthis to uh, escalate uh, their attacks across the border into Saudi Arabia and potentially into the UAE. It also, of course, raises tensions uh, in the, the north uh, between uh, Israel and Iran in Syria, uh, between Israel and Hezbollah, Israel and Hamas, uh, all of those areas. And, and again, uh, it goes back to this point that if the Iranians decide uh, for whatever reason, that uh, that they are now in a situation where they need to uh, retaliate, where they need to raise uh, the ante for uh, all of the forces that they see encircling them, uh, not only Saudi Arabia and UAE, although they would see those as the softest targets, uh, but also U.S. forces, Israel, uh, there are many uh, different areas, uh, uh, many different fronts that they could exploit, uh, many different uh, militias and and uh, and affiliated organizations like Hezbollah, the Houthis, uh, uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, that they could use in order to increase the price and increase the pressure on uh, what they see as their opponents. Jerry, it seems like there have been some pretty mixed signals on both sides. Uh, on the one hand, Trump basically said last week that the Iranians just needed to call him. And on the other hand, we've got this kind of sharp ratcheting up of tensions. Is this a sort of good cop, bad cop routine? Does this reflect the uh, kind of broader dispute within the administration? What's your kind of take on that? Well, uh, I can say that uh, that what the Iranians believe, based on Zarif's comments while he was here, is that they do believe that there's a difference within the administration and that they believe that Donald Trump uh, wants to use this maximum pressure campaign on them in order to force them back to the negotiating table. Uh, they don't believe that Donald Trump is personally looking for a conflict. They distinguish that from what Zarif referred to in his Asia Society speech as the B team, by which he meant John Bolton, Bibi Netanyahu, Mohammed bin Salman, and Mohammed bin Zayed. And he did accuse those four of trying to use this campaign as a way of forcing a conflict. So the Iranians do believe uh, that, uh, that there may be a negotiating path forward with Trump, uh, although whether they see that now or prior to the November 2020 presidential election here in the United States is an open question. 
Alex, what is your sense of what the divides are like uh, within the Iranian regime on this issue? Uh, obviously, in addition to what Foreign Minister Zarif said, I've noticed that the Supreme Leader has also been trying to cool things down, saying there would be no war, saying that, you know, we don't want it, they don't want it either. What's your kind of sense on, on the divides in Tehran? I genuinely think that's the reading in Tehran, that the United States as a whole is not right now ready uh, or even willing to go to war with Iran. So I don't think Khamenei made that uh, point in his speech this week uh, lightly. Uh, in terms of differences within the Iranian regime, I think they haven't really shifted much, despite the sort of increase in tensions and this war of words that we've seen in the last couple of days. You have the supreme leader, uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, um, and you have the generals around him from the Revolutionary Guards who believe, who have always believed that you have to speak to the United States from a position of strength, that if you give in to U.S., the United States will simply come back to you and demand more, that if you give in on a nuclear issue, that was the argument all along, that there will be a point where the U.S. will come and say, well, give us you know, concessions on A and B and C as well. What are you doing in the region? Why are you this way at home and so on? That's the line of argument by the hardliners. And I put the two principal actors within the hardline camp together on this, Khamenei, the Supreme Leader, and the Revolutionary Guards. Now, the, the other side in the presidential palace in the shape of Hassan Rouhani and his foreign minister, Javad Zarif, you know, they probably are much more inclined to sort of want to talk to the United States, less categorical in, in their sort of posturing about whether you sort of meet the United States from a position of strength or not. They probably don't get too uh, worked out, up uh, about some of those sort of issues. Um, but having said that, when we talk about you know, a potential round of talks between the Iranians and the Trump administration, both sides, frankly, would need to show flexibility. If you look at the Trump administration's list of demands from May of 2018, which are basically 12 demands about what Iran does in terms of its nuclear program, missile program, what it does in the region, and they subsequently added a third point, the 13th point, which is about Iranian human rights violations at home, if you put that list together and you want that to be the starting point of talks with the Iranians, it's really hard to see how that can ever fly. It amounts to asking the Iranians before the talks start that they agree that they're going to entirely change, they make up the nature of the regime. It won't be called the Islamic Republic anymore once they do that. And obviously, uh, the Iranian regime feels it, it hasn't reach that point yet, that it can try and get itself out of this position. And one of the things they're clearly doing right now, because I totally agree with what Jerry said, they don't think President Trump wants to go to war with them. And they have identified three countries as essentially shaping, if not dictating, American Middle East policy right now. And those three countries are Israel, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates. That is the view in Tehran. Whether we like it or not, doesn't matter. That's how the Iranians look at it. So it's not a coincidence that over the course of the last month, we've had the Iranians cheering on Islamic Jihad with its rocket fire from Gaza into Israel and an Iranian promise that maybe these Palestinians one day soon will have better missiles. Uh, to aim at Israel with, which is a clear threat to the Israelis, which the Israeli government has recognized, publicly recognized that this is probably one way Iran will get to Israel. And, you know, on top of that, we had the attacks on the vessels off the coast of UAE and the uh, oil pipeline in Saudi Arabia. All of them are, relatively speaking, from an Iranian uh, point of view, only signals, only attempts to get the attention of these three countries to get them to get to Trump and say, OK, maybe we should change, shift here and, and, and do something different than we've done because, you know, it, it's it's potentially getting out of control. At least that is what I think uh, the driving forces in Tehran are 
are you know busy trying to put together whether they're going to succeed or not, I don't know. But let me, Alistair, one other point, uh, because we talked about whether Iran was involved in the attack on the vessels or not. And, and time will show if that's the case or not. But the fact is they were advertising it before anybody else. The Iranians and the Russian media were the first ones to advertise these attacks. And we've had prominent Iranian members of the uh, parliament in that country talk about you know, how weak uh, the security situation is in some of these uh, Arab states of the Persian Gulf. Again, a pretty explicit threat that if you continue egging the United States on to come to war uh, uh, against Iran, we will come back and the uh, potential conflict to be had will not be limited to Iranian soil. But, you know, whether these are going to shape calculations in places like Riyadh, Abu Dhabi or Jerusalem, I don't know. But that's at least what I think the Iranians are, are trying to do. Seems like the message is uh, you've got a really nice oil pipeline there. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. Um, Jerry, you look like you wanted to, to comment on Alex's uh, what Alex had to say. No, I, I agree completely with his comments. Uh, yeah. What's the uh, the role of the, the Europeans in all of this? I know uh, Secretary Pompeo was in Brussels this week, uh, kind of last minute change of plans, seemed designed to sort of present a united front, didn't really go to plan. Is there any hope of uh, kind of bridging the divide, at least in a short-term basis, between the U.S. And, and Europe on this? Well, my understanding of Pompeo's trip to Brussels and and uh, uh, meetings with the uh, British, French, and and German foreign ministers, um, serially, not together, was uh, uh, twofold. One, he wanted to brief them on uh, what uh, we understood of the uh, intelligence that, that we've gathered, what we believe is, uh, uh, is going on in the region. And then he also uh, clearly uh, wanted to, to uh, demonstrate that, in, in fact, there is broad support for the U.S. approach. I think that on the first point, my understanding is that, uh, indeed, uh, the, uh, the three uh, foreign ministers heard his comments and were and were very concerned about uh, about the intelligence, uh, but they were also very concerned about what the United States is doing. And it was pretty clear that from their perspective, uh, they absolutely don't want to see the situation deteriorate further. Uh, they are concerned by what both sides are doing in terms of ratcheting up the tension, uh, and they would like to see uh, this whole issue put back in the box. And I think it's equally instructive uh, that the Spanish pulled uh, one of their naval vessels out of the uh, out of the uh, supporting uh, vessels accompanying the USS Abraham Lincoln on its way into the Gulf. And while they didn't say so explicitly, there certainly have been reports. Uh, that the rationale for doing that was that they didn't want to be drawn into a U.S.-Iranian conflict. Uh, they wanted to stay away. And so uh, I think that what that should demonstrate to Washington is that um, if, the, if the situation does deteriorate further, if there is some kind of a, a hot war between the U.S. and Iran, uh, the Europeans are very likely to say that they're going to sit this one out. Alex, we're running short on time here, but uh, where do you see things going from here? I think the Iranians are hoping that they will be getting the Europeans to give them enough economic assistance, if you will, trade enough with them that they can uh, prevent further um, economic pain at home. Uh, I mean, one of the things we haven't really discussed, and this is a great unknown in many ways, is what are the Trump administration's Iran's strategy is actively trying to instigate uh, unrest within Iran. Uh, one thing is to put sanctions on them and hope that there will be a revolution of sorts in, inside Iran. Another way is if you have an intelligence-led operation that is actively trying to come to that uh, you know, objective. I don't know the answer to that, but certainly the Iranians feel that if there is more money coming in from the export of, say, crude oil and trade with Europe, that would give them more time. Having said that, it seems to me they're losing hope in Europe for whatever reason, whether it's structural or, or other factors. The Europeans are, from at least an Iranian perspective, acting very slowly, uh, which uh, really leaves the Iranians in a position to have to come to 
uh, this reality that they've tried to avoid for so long, which is, is there a way to talk to Trump directly? Because if we don't, then, you know, we can't rely on the Europeans and who on earth uh, could could we talk to as as someone that can mediate the Russians, the Chinese? There aren't many good candidates out there. So I wonder if they're getting to a point where they realize this this individual in the White House is not someone they like, but can they really afford to wait for another two years for the next U.S. election? And what if Trump is um, reelected? Can this Iranian economy in this country of 80 million people under the most severe sanctions ever seen in history of man wait another six more years? I, I don't know if they are that courageous, that bold in their own capabilities. So I, 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 you know, it might come to a point where they might surprise us and reach out to Trump and talk to him, see if there is a way to talk to him, uh, because the alternative is is not pretty. Jerry, any final thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. Uh, what I would say is that uh, while Zarif was here in, in the U.S., he did uh, tell people that uh, that the Iranian calculation is that Donald Trump will be reelected in 2020 uh, and that they do anticipate that there's going to be six more years of economic pressure. Uh, they also, of course, have talked about uh, the uh, the number of times they claim that the administration has tried to uh, contact them to engage them in some kind of a discussion and the fact that uh, that they uh, for their part have uh, refused those openings and and uh, and outreach uh, and uh, and whether or not the uh, Iranians can withstand this kind of of pressure for two more years six more years uh, re- certainly remains to be seen. Uh, um, Zarif uh, was clear that the Iranians believe they will still be able to export uh, oil uh, regardless of the U.S. sanctions. Certainly, if you look at previous efforts, uh, I was involved, of course, in uh, the efforts uh, through the 1990s up until 2003 of cutting off Iraqi uh, oil exports, never succeeded despite full on uh, uh, effort uh, with uh, the support of the international community to try to accomplish that. Um, uh, I think that uh, that the Iranians uh, want to uh, demonstrate to the U.S. Uh, and to our uh, allies and partners in the region uh, that, uh, one, um, they are resilient and will be able to withstand whatever pressure we uh, put on them, and two, uh, that, uh, as Zarif said, uh, if they feel that they're being bled to death, uh, they will not go down by themselves. They're going to take others with them. And I think that that's exactly where we are right now. It goes back to Alex's first observation, and that is that, uh, you know, the real risk here is not that the parties want a war and tend to go to war, uh, but you are on a, an escalatory uh, slope here where even a miscalculation can lead you in a direction you don't want to go in. We'll have to leave it there, but this is obviously a situation we'll be continuing to watch closely going forward. Jerry, Alex, thank you again for joining us on the program today. My pleasure. Thank you, Alistair. And thank you as well to our audience for listening in and to our production team for their work on today's program. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.